The Old Testament reading is from Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you, you shall not name her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access to by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 8th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and all the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And Jesus told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to him the crowd of his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ.
for why a baby dies, an answer to why you have certain likes and dislikes, a reason why there are planets and mosquitoes, a reason for your depression, a reason for your acceleration. There is that thing called reality. There's an answer to everything. You may not know the answer, but there's an answer to everything. Anything outside of reality, though, is not real. And no matter how hard you may believe something that's not real, it's still not real. You can't change that, right? It's where you may actually be wrong with some of your ideas. Have you ever been wrong with some of your ideas? Or maybe you harbor an illusion. I bet every one of us harbors illusions that we actually think are real. The Holy Scriptures are very poignant about reality and very poignant about something I'm going to talk about. And Jesus' words today, uh, they don't get any stronger about reality. What really is going on as opposed to what's not going on. And it's going to separate what you normally strive for to what really is actually happening. And this is the thing that's going to challenge you. And what's interesting is that Jesus brings this reality about everything. And he brings it to you in a paradox. We just heard a paradox. A paradox is this. A statement that is apparently absurd or self-contradictory, but is really true on a different level or a higher level. A statement that is apparently absurd when you first hear it or read it, self-contradictory, but is really true on a different level. Example, all endings are beginnings. Well, if you're in the midst of doing something and you end a project or you know, you end church today, you know it's an end to church. So to say all endings are beginnings at first seems absurd. But if you step back and kind of zoom out, you come to understand what the paradox is speaking of. Because every time you end something, when you end church today, you're going to go to Bible study. You're going to walk out the door. You're going to have lunch. See how that works? So that's a paradox. In one sense, it's absurd. And in another sense, at a higher level, it's true. See how that works? Now with that, I'm going to challenge you with some questions today. And they seem obvious. The answer seems obvious to you at first, right? It's this. Uh, what would you rather do? A, suffer and die. Or B, be healed of what troubles you and live. What was your answer? A. Nobody here automatically thinks that way because you live life preserving your life. Let me ask you another question. What would you rather do? Preserve your life as you currently know it or redefine your attitude and response to suffering? This is more challenging. Maybe you'll bite. Would you rather preserve your life as you currently know it or redefine your attitude and response to suffering. Jesus says, what you initially don't want to hear in regards to those two questions. And he says it against your illusions about reality. That's what he did in our gospel lesson today. I hope you heard it. Jesus does it by way of the most profound paradox, a statement that is apparently absurd or self-contradictory on one level, but is really true on a higher level. And in this case, the eternal level. Example, all endings are beginnings. No, they're not. But then again, yes, they are. Now, I want you to know these two things, and I'm going to keep repeating this for the rest of my ministry here at Emmanuel, and hopefully for the rest of my life for myself personally. Because Christianity has everything to do with these two things. Number one, seeing everything through their eternal perspective. That's the only way you can see God, what God is saying. See everything through the eternal perspective. And the other thing I have to do to know is to pick up my cross and follow Jesus because he made it safe. Eternal perspective, pick up your cross and follow him because he made it safe. This is what Jesus is saying to you is reality as opposed to all of your illusions that you fall 
across the line. And he begins by doing this. Who do you say that I am? And Peter gets it right. You are the Christ. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ. Bravo, Peter. You're right. Now, this is what reality is. This is the reality about what Christ must do. He must be handed over. He will suffer. He will die. And he will rise again. Now, here's the illusion. Peter says, no, that's not what's going to happen to you. Who's right? Jesus or Peter? Well, at first, I would suggest to you, it seems like Peter is right, because Jesus is the most important human being that's ever existed on the face of the earth. He is the Messiah, so to preserve Jesus at all costs seems to be the right plan, doesn't it? Because you're the Christ. It seems absurd that you will now be handed over in a defeated manner, suffer, die, and then rise again. And to this, Jesus responds, get behind me, Satan. The most strongest language you can use. Get behind me, Satan, as to tell Peter that his ideas about Messiah and Messiah's life to preserve it is synonymous with Satan's temptation in the wilderness. Because Satan said the same thing. You can gain the whole world, Jesus, through me, because I'm the prince of this world. Why don't you give up this way, give up reality, and I'll make you king of the earth. Your friends, the greatest reality of all, keep this in your heart. Jesus is the Savior of the world. And so by entering this world, his incarnation, reality is that he must suffer, die, in order to rise. He must suffer and die in order to rise. Now you get a good idea of the severity of your present condition and why you live in illusion. And what Jesus has to do if reality goes forth. Now for the paradox. After he gets done telling his disciples, yes, this is what Jesus must do, the Messiah must do, suffer, die, and rise, then he turns to them. In other words, he's turning to you right now. He says, if anyone would actually come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross here and follow me. Here we go. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, which means the good news, will save it. There's your paradox, the greatest paradox for you to wrestle with in your life. Save your life to lose it, but lose your life to save it. And you say what? In fact, he says, if you were so good at saving your life and preserving your life to the extent that you could gain everything that the world offers, Satan's temptation, you would have nothing. You wouldn't even have life. The definition of a paradox, a statement that is apparently absurd. Doesn't that sound absurd? Self-contradictory. Doesn't that sound self-contradictory? But it's really true from the perspective of God and on an eternal level. So do you believe that? I want you to really ask yourself the question, do you believe that? You know, I'll answer for you. Here's what I say. I say, in my head, I do. I understand that. Theologically, I understand that. Theoretically, But then I step into my reality. I live what I would suggest is my reality. I begin to live my illusion, and I hold on to it so tightly that these words become the scariest thing in the world. And they start off with your blessings. And the reason why I go up against what Jesus is saying is he's saying, lose your life means what? Lose all your temporary blessings, and I love my temporary blessings, and I can also tell you all of my temporary blessings are from God. Money, occupation, hobbies, spouse, 
children, grandchildren, a cold glass of beer, roof over your head, the vacation that's coming soon, all for petition stuff, all those things that are blessings, but you prefer them. I prefer them. All those things you enjoy and thank God for, and you should thank God for, they are from God. But here's how you and I ruin it. You and I turn them into idols. We break the first commandment. We turn our blessings and we give them eternal status. We give them divine status and they are not that. We change them and ruin them by turning them into an idol. That's what an idol is, taking a good thing and making it beyond what it actually is. And these things replace reality. And that's where the rub is. Change your temporary status, which is what you would expect it to be forever, and then you replace God to one degree or another. This, in turn, causes you to lose sight of eternity, and listen, you lose sight to reality. And that's what we do. The reality that you don't belong here. And that is why Jesus came to get you out. <laughs> and to get you out involves suffering, dying, and rising. Suffering and dying in order to rise from this cruel world that we live in. You don't belong here. Stop taking your blessings and making mistakes that are permanent. And when God tries to take them away from you for your good, you begin to howl. Let me give you two analogies that I came up with that I think will fixate this whole thing. And I was going to find some sand, but it would make a mess. It's very hard to find some sand. So I want you to picture a handful of sand. Okay? And those are your blessings. The sand is the blessings. And I got a handful of sand, right? God's blessings. And what do I do when I hold on to it too tightly? I squeeze it. And when I squeeze it, what happens to the sand? It slips through my fingers. Because I turn them into idols. I want them to be my eternal reality. When God wants so much more for you, I squeeze them and then they are gone. I have another picture for you. Picture yourself on a cruise liner ship. You're in the swimming pool of a cruise liner Shit. Isn't that wonderful? It's heated, you're swimming, you're having a good time, but the ship is sinking into the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> right? Think about that. I'm not against you being on a cruise line in that pool.
reality of loss and what's actually happening to you. God is moving you into eternity and a whole new reality on suffering. It's interesting, I was already done with the sermon pretty much. It was Friday and I got a call and I got to make, listen to this, my first hospital visit in almost a year. I got in. I got in. Now I just talked to somebody else and said, you ain't getting into this hospital. <laughs> but I got in. They told me I had a window of 15 minutes. I saw a member of our congregation who came very close to death. And I decided to have the devotion I like the most. And it has to do with 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It has everything to do with this. By the way, your things have everything to do with this too. 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, we have this treasure, the gospel, the good news, all of it, reality. We have this reality in earthly vessels or jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from ourselves. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not destroyed, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be delivered. Over the death of Jesus, thanks for the life of Jesus also may be manifest in my mortal flesh. This changes everything. Thank God Jesus did not follow illusions about this life. Thank God he did not succumb to the temptation that you succumb to regarding the permanency of your temporary blessings. Thank God that Jesus knew reality means that he had to suffer, die, so that he can rise. You are suffering so that you may someday rise. The eternal perspective about what's really going on changes your view on everything. And it's a true and comforting motivation now to pick up my cross, follow Jesus through the suffering of death, through everything that I'm going through, because resurrection is on the other side of that. Because he made it safe for everybody. And that's reality. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all of our human understanding in our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, the God who is Father before all worlds, God of God, light of life, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being in one substance with the Father, by whom all things are made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us in the conscious Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come in with the glory, as the of the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord of the universe.